so this is the piece from Sierra Magazine, which is my own reflection on participation in Earth Day 50 years ago. Most of us cannot recall any given day 50 years ago, but April 22nd, 1970 stands out for the intoxicating smell of freshly mimeographed flyers and the smell of mud. I was in high school and organized the first Earth Day observance there. We marched to the auditorium where our small band of students gave what we hoped were inspiring speeches, using science to change the mind and poetry to change the hearts. After the bell rang, we intrepid eco-warriors skipped classes and spent the day hand digging a pond in a damp depression in the woods behind school to create a refuge for salamanders. The mud was heavy, but our spirits were light and we sang as we worked. While our tiny pond filled with water, the streets of faraway cities filled with throngs of people demanding an end to oil spills and an antidote to songbirds falling dead from the sky. Fueled by outrage at rivers on fire, on that single day, more than 20 million people took to the streets to hold both the government and corporate polluters accountable. And it worked. Those massive demonstrations led to the creation of the EPA, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, NEPA, and revolutionary legislation that we rely on today. And it didn't happen because industry and government thought it was a good idea. It happened because the people in the streets demanded a livable planet for people and for birds and for salamanders. And given today's polarized political scene, it's striking that the movement was supported by disparate constituencies, rural and urban, left and right, rich and poor. The earth beneath our feet formed our political common ground. The ensuing success of Earth Day over five decades created a movement with remarkable outcomes from global to local. Earth Day has become, in the words of its organizers, the largest secular observance in the world, a day of action that changes human behavior. Now, school kids planting trees and neighbors picking up trash are emblematic of elevated ecological citizenship and growing political will. The calls to make every day Earth Day predictably follow every event, and that's good. Corporations find it a bonus occasion to green their brands, despite continuing exploitation. I fear that the fierce energy of that first Earth Day has become tame and softened into a kind of green complacency, that if we just recycle more and buy green products, then all will be well. Or we choose to ignore it and adopt the counter narrative that we are powerless to change anything about the fearsome trajectory that business as usual has set. Neither of those stories will save us. There was a time before we knew when we trusted that small incremental acts of ecological action would propel the collective shifts that we need. The problem is we don't have time. Earth Day as usual, polite exercise of stewardship is wholly inadequate to the scope and urgency of the climate emergency. Climate scientists estimate that our window of opportunity to reduce the drastic impacts of fossil fuel driven catastrophe is less than two decades. That little frog pond that we dug as teenagers was a good teacher. We are called to pick up our shovels and plant trees, restore degraded habitats, plant community gardens, and protect biodiversity in our backyards. The Earth Day mantra of think globally, act locally still has power, but we have to recognize that our shovels in the ground are no match for power shovels, ripping open the taiga for tar sands. Our campaigns for beach cleanup save wildlife and water with every dumpster of trash, but they're a grain of sand compared to the oceanic plastic patch. Donations to conservation are vital, but dwarfed by the investments of fossil fuel companies who knowingly collude to wring the last dollar from the land while the earth is burning. On Earth Day, a few years ago, 
I apologized to one of my beloved ESF students who was about to graduate and go out to a career in environmental activism. I'm sorry, I said to her, that you have to still fight these battles. I thought we would have had this figured out by now. No, she said, Dr. Kimmerer, don't you see that this is the best possible time to be alive? Climate chaos? Extinction crisis? I didn't get it. But she looked me in the eye and said, right, we are on the precipice. But when everything hangs in the balance, it matters where I stand. How wonderful it is to live in a time when everything that I do matters, when my life matters. If our leaders won't lead, then we will. On Earth Day, I want to join my students and millions more in the streets again, marching as an outpouring of love for the Earth. For grief for what has been lost, defense of what remains, in defiance of corporate greed, to stand shoulder to shoulder with people refusing to be complicit with a worldview of exploitation, who rally around kinship with the living earth. On the first Earth Day, our hands were stained with mimeograph ink because we need both science and poetry to incite justice for all beings, the feathered, the leafy, the furred, the finned, for rivers and forests and people. And then we take up our shovels and get to work, planting the world that we want, because what we do matters. <laughs>